So I feel like my reading in February went spectacularly well actually, although it was very different, I feel, than how I usually read. So in February, the interesting thing about my reading is that it was so sporadic. Like I alternated between reading 400 pages a day to reading 30 pages a day and it kind of balanced itself out, which is an unusual way of reading for me. I know a lot of people do this, like especially if you work at, at, at I guess a classic nine to five job, you typically won't read very much in the week and maybe you dedicate your weekends to reading. That has never been me. I'm a, a slow and steady consistency wins the race kind of girl where I read a hundred pages a day regardless. And then when I've read my hundred pages, I kind of just like move on to other things. But February was very different and I feel like it really, really worked for me. I did read seven books in total. So not like the most in total of, of amount of books, but I did also DNF two books and I also made it over 100 pages into two others. I swear if February wasn't the shortest month of the year I would have almost another like 1,000 pages <laughs> to add to February's total but everything that I read as well I read one 350 page book and everything else was no shorter than 480 pages so everything else was at home. The majority of things didn't stray too far over so there were no like 800 page books but everything was consistently around 500 pages and I'm, I'm really happy but we'll get into the stats. So in the month of February I read a grand total of 3,478 pages which breaks down to an average of 124 pages per day which if we go off average pages per day this puts February as a better month for me than January even though my total pages for January were slightly higher they were around 3,600 I think. For the star ratings we had one three star read, five four stars and one five star which breaks down to an average of four stars per book potentially the average would have been a little bit lower if I hadn't have DNF'd the two books that I did. For the demographics we had one middle grade this month we had one young adult and we had five adult books. For the formats four of them were standardly formatted novels and three of them were ebooks. For the genres we had three fantasy romance, two fantasy, one romance and one sci-fi so very much sticking with my core genres this month. And for the places where I sourced these books from five of them were from my own TBR that existed prior to the start of 2023 and two of them I read on Kindle Unlimited. So as usual we are going to be going through these in chronological order starting with one that I read as an ebook but I have since got a physical copy of because I enjoyed it that much which is We Hunt the Flame by Hafsa Faisal. This one was my Patreon pick for was it January or December? I'm not sure but it was Meg's pick anyway and I was very unsure about this. It's a young adult fantasy, it's a reasonably popular one or it was at the time that it was released. I think this one's 2019 potentially? 2019 and it was published around the time where I was kind of switching off a little bit from YA fantasy so I never intended to pick this one up but it, it did come up as a Patreon pick and I, I really thoroughly enjoyed this one. I gave it four stars. So this one is set in a world that has been cursed. All of the magic has been removed and now there is a cursed forest that is spreading over the land and each area of this world has a different kind of like magical affliction and the place where our main character is from is now cold and snowy where it used to be a desert city so the architecture is really suffering from the cold and the moisture because this this country was just not built to withstand this kind of climate and on top of that the people of the place where Zafira is from are struggling to feed themselves so far as long as she can remember she has been dressing up as a man and going into the cursed forest to hunt and feed her people and the people of the villages around where she lives. Our secondary character in here is the sultan's son and he is called Nazir. His mother died when he was quite a bit younger and up until the death of his mother his father was by all intents and purposes a pretty great guy but something has happened since his mother's death and the sultan is becoming increasingly more cruel and ruthless so Nazir has been fashioned by the sultan into some kind of like royal assassin and he hates it but he has no alternative because if he goes against his father then his father hurts the people that he cares about so everybody is kind of aware of the hunter or the huntress even though they don't know the hunter's identity and so Zafira is recruited to go to this magical island and to steal an artifact to bring magic back to the land. Now what she doesn't know is that the sultan has also sent Nazir to pursue her so that when she finds the magical artifact he can then kill her and steal it off her and the first book We Hunt the Flame is the the journey to get that magical object. So this is this is good YA like the tropes the plot devices 
the plot structure in here is nothing that I haven't seen before but it wasn't done in a way that felt like a repeat or like a cliche it was just things that I really love in YA fantasy done really really well so there wasn't a great deal there were a couple of things that took me by surprise but there wasn't a great deal going on in this story that I didn't expect or didn't see coming but it was executed in a way that I love this gave me big throne of glass vibes as well if you were a fan of throne of glass back in the day I think you would have a great time with we hunt the flame we have the like angsty relationship drama going on in here we have enemies to lovers and then one plot line in particular in here is like very very reminiscent I would say of Throne of Glass. My one kind of criticism of this is that the characters are very well fleshed out at the beginning which is not the criticism obviously but they're very much formed into like three-dimensional people with like lives and histories and families. That development of the characters kind of puts a roadblock in the way of something that you're pretty sure is going to happen when you read the synopsis of this and my criticism is is the 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 path clearing for that thing to actually happen happens in the space of a chapter so we spend all this time building them up to having these backstories just for the slate to kind of be wiped clean all at once for it to progress in the way that you always knew it was going to progress anyway yeah i'm really excited to read the sequel we free the stars and i'll be very interested to read more from hafsa Faisal in the future the second book that i read was my one five star of the month which was love on the brain by ali hazelwood which is this is my i'm gonna call it my second five star of the year the first one being the love hypothesis there was a third five star but it was a reread of a favorite book so I don't feel like it counts but yeah that is 100% Ali Hazelwood five stars this year and I'm planning on reading Love Theoretically in March because I do have an arc of it. So this is of course an adult contemporary romance surrounding scientists and in this one we are following B, who has been offered the opportunity of a lifetime. She is going to be helping NASA to make helmets for astronauts and she is providing the the neurology I guess information I don't know if that's the correct term but essentially she's like a brain scientist and because of the project and, and what they're making she needs to team up with an engineer and when she is sent to NASA she finds out that the person she's going to be teamed up with is somebody that she hated in grad school because he refused to work on a project with her like he always kind of treated her he didn't treat her badly but he always behaved strangely around her and he flat out refused to work on a project with her once so she has come to the conclusion that he absolutely despises her so she goes to NASA to work at NASA on this project truly expecting the worst and obviously it's a romance so there is a lot of sexism in this book which was quite uncomfortable to read throughout the beginning of it I will say that after the setup while it does still play a part in the story it does ease off a little bit and it, it fully intends to make you feel uncomfortable and angry which is the point but just get letting you guys know you might get a little bit heated throughout the beginning of this because obviously like like women in science like you're gonna face a lot of sexism in that industry because it is considered as like stereotypically like a male dominated industry so this one was a hate to love kind of situation but it had everything that I loved about the love hypothesis in it it had once again my favorite romantic pairing when it comes to co contemporary romances which is a guy that is a bad guy that is made out to be a bad guy but for every experience you have with him he's a stand-up like just solid guy and a girl who is incredibly caffeinated and highly strong and can't see one foot in front of her face so if you really like the love hypothesis like I did and you want like the same kind of story with the same kind of story beats love on the brain is definitely like something that you will enjoy I still slightly enjoy the love hypothesis more and it's nothing too dramatic they're both five star reads I adored both of them but I think I prefer Olive slightly more to B which is why that one is currently my favorite and I guess we'll see how love theoretically plays into this as well oh something I do want to say about this actually just before I move on the man in here is compared like there's a there's a line in here where she says that he's built like a Victorian mansion I swear to god that is the sexiest description I've ever heard <laughs> I then finished up the four horsemen series by Laura Thalassa this one was my first fantasy romance for February and this one was my favorite in the series I gave it a four star we've had lots of ups and downs in the four horsemen series and I very much felt like Laura Thalassa was building up to this one the entire time and because of that this one just had so much more to offer than the the first three did. So the Four Horsemen series as I'm sure you are aware at this point is a series of dystopian fantasy-ish romances where each book follows one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse as they come down to earth to bring about the end of days. So the apocalypse is this one big timeline we start off with pestilence and there's a break of like 
a handful of years in between each horseman coming down to wreak havoc and they all fall in love with human women along the way that change their perspective on the tasks that they've been given to perform. I feel like when we talk about this series as a whole, Pestilence is a fun introduction, War does something a little bit different, has a very different style of killing and a very different way of I guess traversing the world than the others do. I feel like Laura Thalassa very much lost her way with famine as to me it was just like it was pretty much the same as Pestilence but with less going on and death was a culmination of everything that we've read so far. One of the things that I loved the most about this is that the characters were so well suited to each other. I feel like this one had the best sexual tension of the series. So we have Death who obviously is the harbinger of death and then we have Lazarus who for some reason cannot die. So a good part of of this book is them two being mortal enemies and attempting to kill each other over and over again but neither of them can die. We also had some really cool symbolism in here with things like the lovers and the the juxtaposition, the contrast of life versus death. One of the things that I, I particularly enjoyed about this one is death's outlook on his task because obviously this is this is slightly religious in nature because the four horsemen of the apocalypse who were first present in the old testament but i would say that it's only kind of like religious in origin but it did have a kind of religious take in how death views his task as he views it as an end of suffering like it's not to die is not a bad thing it is bringing um peace to humans by ending their suffering so i really enjoyed the discussion of that in here like i said all of the symbolism great sexual tension and the culmination of the plot was a little bit more dramatic and actually kind of cinematic which I wasn't expected and then of course the very last chapter. I didn't cry but damn was it emotional which was not what I was expecting when I started this series with Pestilence being like this is a good time that we can't take too seriously because if you think about it too hard it kind of starts to fall apart. So would I recommend this series? Not necessarily, it's fun but it's not amazing but I did really enjoy Death. I then wrapped up another series which is the Frostheart series by Jamie Littler. So this one is a middle grade series following a young boy called Ash who lives in this like snowy tundra where the cities are few and far between. So there are a group of people called I think they're Pathfinders whose job it is to go between all of these little snowy strongholds and like trade, move goods and pass messages and all that kind of jazz. So Ash has actually been abandoned in one of these strongholds by his parents who are Pathfinders quite a few years before this story starts starts and since then he's been passed between families and he's currently being raised by a yeti called Tobu and Ash actually has a gift which is the gift of song. He is a song weaver and song weaving is bad in this world because when you sing you can communicate with all of the monsters that live in the snow. So one day Ash is caught song weaving, he's expelled from his community and he joins a Pathfinder crew aboard the Frost Heart and sets out to find his parents. This is, it's not my favourite middle grade series, I gave this finally installment three stars which is actually I think my lowest rated of the three. What I really like about this series is the sense of found family and the emotional moments and I guess the plot beats like there were plot twists in this series that I didn't expect. The reason why it's not my favourite middle grade series is because it is very very fast paced. We have a lot of big battles, big dramatic moments, a lot of action sequences throughout the series which as you guys know it doesn't matter the demographic or the genre that's just really not my preferred story style. I like things to be a little bit slower and obviously in fantasy and especially in children's books so you're gonna get um, a little bit more faster pacing. You're gonna have like a lot of big battles but like with every genre, every demographic that isn't always the focus and in this series it has a little bit more action than I typically prefer to read which was especially evident when we came to this final installment because this was just pretty much a conclusion. So we start this book in the middle of a conflict that begins at the end of book two and there is very little reprieve throughout this. There's a little bit of travel in here and there's a series of large battles to bring the story to a close. So in terms of the series as a whole it was definitely my least favourite but purely just because of how action driven this one was. But I do really like this series. I'm obviously not the target demographic for this as well so I do feel like in terms of children's books this is a really good series. It's just not my favourite and obviously I'm an adult so is my opinion valid? Not particularly. I then read a fantasy romance on Kindle Unlimited 
limited and I actually read the sequel a little bit later in the month as well but that is the Kingdom of Crows series the first book being House of Beating Wings and the second book being House of Pounded Hearts both by Olivia Wildenstein so I picked up the first book for a 24 hour readathon with my patrons the reason why I was interested in this one is because Olivia Wildenstein is an author who's going to be at Rare in July and I didn't know what to expect from this I was going in purely based on the fact that it was a fairy romance and I ended up really enjoying it as you can probably tell because I picked up the sequel immediately so this one has it has a rocky start okay the writing isn't the best it reminded me a lot thematically and in terms of I guess the relationship it reminded me a lot of the Plated Prisoner series by Raven Kennedy but in pure addictiveness how it's not the best thing I've ever read but still super compelling and I really enjoyed it it reminded me of Savage Lands by Stacey Marine Brown and it also it was given a little bit of Fortuna Swan as well you know but this is a I say it's a fairy romance it's a fantasy romance series that does include fae but we also have a race of all his species of sorceresses who are the Shabans. There's also the crows who were eradicated hundreds of years before this story starts. And then we also have half fae and humans. So our main character is a half fae called Fallon. And you're gonna have to bear with me because the setup for this story is messy. But Fallon is in love with the prince and she's half fae. So she is very much looked down upon. And her mother and her grandmother were actually excommunicated from fae society because Fallon is half fae. But despite this, she ended up going to a school with the elite pure-blooded Fae, even though literally everybody hates her and her family were excommunicated because of her birth. So that is how she became close to the prince anyway. He's been gone for four years. She's in love with him. He comes back and she's hoping that they can maybe rekindle their relationship, but they do have a huge obstacle in the way, which is that she's half Fae and will never be accepted amongst the nobility. So she is at a human party one night with a couple of her friends, because there's also another guy who's into her, which is this fisherman called Anthony. And he takes her to this party while this big fae party that she hasn't been invited to is going on. But while she's there, she meets an oracle who tells her that she will be the queen of the realm. And all she has to do is hunt down six iron crows. So she takes this to mean that she's gonna marry Dante and become the queen of the kingdom. And that is the reason why she goes along looking for these these iron crows. So that's kind of like the initial setup of this as we get into it very much like if you're talking about the Akatar series or the Plated Prisoner series everything kind of changes quite vastly like the more you get into the series the more far removed we are from this original like initial synopsis but what I really enjoyed about this is it is weird because like it does have a rocky start and throughout the first 20% I was really like some of the word choices are interesting it's kind of like the author sat there with a thesaurus picking some of the like descriptive terms throughout this book and there is kind of like a lot going on and I feel like it could be introduced throughout this series a little bit smoother to make it just just easier to get into but when I got to the 20% mark I was just super absorbed and um, like I said this is definitely not the best thing I ever read but I definitely thought that it was very appealing and very compelling to the point where I couldn't put it down. One of my main kind of not main kind of gripes with it but something that was kind of getting to me throughout the second book is that the romance in here is very slow to start. It makes sense throughout the first book while we don't have the most romantic development but then getting into book two I felt like it took a little bit too long for us to get to a position where it was going in more the direction or like a more romantic direction and when it did get there I felt like it was a little bit abrupt but I do really like the love interest. I really like the world building in here but not necessarily the way that the world is built more the world itself like I feel like the concept this series is conceptually strong although it's not anything that I haven't necessarily read before and I really like the the different realms and kingdoms we have going on in here and the conflict between them all but I would say that the execution could definitely be smoother so yeah I like the world I like the characters I like the different kingdoms and the different specialities I like the antagonists not in a way that I actually like them you know I just like that they're the antagonists if that makes sense so yeah if you're looking for a, a new fantasy romance to go into if you've read like Savage Lands and Fortuna Swan on my recommendation then this might be one that you enjoy it has um I don't want to say it has Italian inspiration it definitely does especially within the language of one of the kingdoms but I don't imagine that it's done very well like it's a very loose Venetian 
inspiration i feel and then i also feel like we have some i'm gonna check this because i don't wanna i feel like it's irish but i'm not sure yeah there is another kingdom in here that has irish inspiration as well once again don't expect that inspiration to be particularly accurate or anything groundbreaking but it's definitely there especially within the language of the kingdoms so next up I guess we'll do it in order. So we'll go through the two books that I did left before the one that I eventually finished. But this was the latest installment of the Goldsboro vlog series, which guys, I'm done. We have one more installment left, but I can confirm that I will be canceling that subscription. I'm going to leave it rolling at the minute because I have three skips that I can utilize. And I also get like a discount on all fantasy and sci-fi. I get like pre-sale access where there is any. And also it gives me the opportunity if they have anything spectacular coming up in the few next few months as part of the subscription that I want. But like, like yeah one more installment of this and we are done because i dnf'd two of the three this time around i'll put the vlog up here if you want like the full experience but the first one i dnf'd just under 100 pages in i think which was mind walker by kate dillon this one was a young adult sci-fi kind of like cyberpunky it was a tech sci-fi about a girl so it's like it's futuristic kind of dystopian civilization has ended and it's been rebuilt but because the population is so low the countries of the world are doing everything possible to keep their citizens within the countries and they're doing that like via incentives and because of everything that's going on in this like newly developed world espionage is a top priority for all of the government so our main character is somebody who has had a computer planted into her brain and her job is to extract government agents and spies from from particularly tricky situations because the computer in her brain allows her to use more of her brain than the average human. She can process information a lot faster. So she is a mind walker and what will happen is an agent will ask for help and she will kind of take over their body and get them out of this situation. The drawback of this is that it comes with a very short lifespan as the computer will start to fry your brain when you get to around age 20. So the main character is like approaching this time when she is asked to publicly perform a mind walk and the information that is found out like the information that the agent was trying to extract is highly sensitive and because she went against government orders and instead of taking the agent to be terminated she actually tried to save them from the situation she is accused of stealing very highly sensitive government information and because of this she ends up going on the run i didn't like the attitude of the main character it was one of those um like she's very arrogant very sure of herself overly confident in a way that she's trying to come off as like i guess cool but it just it's kind of cringy and there was just like there wasn't anything really keeping me in this story i just didn't really enjoy it i actually don't think tech sci-fi is for me if i'm being honest the second one that i dnf'd i was a lot more sad about because this is the one that i expected to enjoy the most and that one is silver under nightfall by rin Chepeco. i expected good things from this because i really liked the bone witch trilogy by rin Chepeco, which i read for a series in a week vlog so i knew that i liked her writing and i liked her stories and this one did start off really promising actually it gave me like interview with a vampire the movie because i haven't read the book which you know the the i would say the best part of the movie where louis and lestat are living it up in like the regency era and we have all of the glamour and the parties and the opulence it was very much given that at the beginning and i made it to around the page 200 mark in here and the thing that really put me off in here is that it just it turned into something that I really don't like because it turned into a whodunit and even down to the plot devices and the style of whodunits where you kind of have a group of people in the room once again like I said about Justice of Kings when I DNF that it was given Agatha Christie in a fantasy setting but you have a big group of characters in a room and the main the main character in here is called Remy and he is the son of a vampire hunter so he is doing that himself but his mother was a vampire and just before she turned she gave birth to him so he's considered as tainted and everybody hates him and they won't let him into the vampire hunter guild so instead they send him on the missions that nobody wants to do hoping that he will die so one day at a party he meets this vampire lady who is um kind of takes him under her wing and she has some influence within this world so when one of the dukes die he teams up with the vampire lady and her fiance to 
get to the bottom of it. So our main character is not an investigator. He is a vampire hunter. And throughout this, we also have a breed, like a new breed of vampires that are kind of like a mutation. They're more like a zombie than a vampire, if I'm being honest. But he's a vampire hunter, not an investigator. So what would happen repeatedly throughout this is that a bunch of characters would gather in a room and they'd just tell each other information. So the main character himself wasn't investigating. He was just going meeting with different people and they were telling him information. And then we'd have a fight scene, which as we've mentioned in this video, I'm not the biggest fan of fight scenes. So yeah, it was just given like Poirot where he's in this big manor house and he walks into a room and you know that somebody in there's the one who's done it. And um, they all give their excuses for why they're not responsible. And it just wasn't for me. I know quite a few people have said that they're sad that I didn't make it further because I, it gets better apparently from the point where I was at, which like I'm willing to bet that it does. It's just when I've made the decision to DNF something, I know that I'm never gonna go back. It's just the kind of person I am and also a lot of people will said that they're sad that I didn't continue because it gets steamy later on and while I do love a good sex scene a sex scene isn't enough to save an entire book for me so I don't feel like that would have made it much better and then the final one the one that I did finish and the one that I actually really enjoyed is The Immortality Thief by Taryn Hunt so this one is a sci-fi about a guy who is facing life in prison and he is given a an out essentially where he has to go to this abandoned ship which is parked next to a sun that's about to go into supernova within the next two weeks and he has to extract the sensitive information out of this ship before the sun blows up. So accompanying him on this mission is a guy that he's known for years from his home planet which was like the city they grew up in was destroyed and two other people who like the person who sent them has sensitive information on these other two people and they are also kind of going into this for the opportunity for a clean slate and also to earn a whole bunch of money as well along the way. So they go to this ship expecting expecting it to be abandoned and it turns out that it is very much not so. I don't want to say too much about it because this is a sci-fi horror so I don't want to ruin any of those horror elements but alongside some interesting creatures there is also a group of ministers that turn up who are an alien species that kind of appeared out of nowhere 1000 years ago and started oppressing the solar system. A group of those turn up as well also looking for this information so as well as all of the horror elements we have going on it's also a race against time as they are racing against against this other group that have turned up for the same information and they're racing against this sun that's gonna blow up. So this is very fast paced, which I usually don't like, but I do find in sci-fi it works for me. And even though when I read horror, which admittedly I don't read a lot of, when I do read horror, I feel like it doesn't particularly scare me. Sci-fi horror does. And I don't know why, but every sci-fi that I've read, I think sci-fi horror always takes me by surprise as well, because when I'm going into one, I never know that it's gonna be a horror until I've started it. And I feel like that might add to why the horror elements actually work for me because I don't go in expecting it to be scary and then and then it turns out scaring me. So like I said, I don't want to spoil the horror elements because like if you know too much, you're obviously not going to be scared. But there is one instance very early on in here of claustrophobia where I feel like it was done so well. There's like a collapsed tunnel and they're trying to get through the tunnel before all of the debris that's like been pressing down for like a thousand years collapses. And the way that it was written and the anxiety of the character really came through in the page to make me feel on edge as somebody who isn't even especially claustrophobic. Like I'm very slightly claustrophobic. I would hate to be trapped in a lift, but like on a day-to-day -day basis, like I'm not scared of small spaces. So I do feel like the horror elements were done very well. I will say that a few of them I felt were quite repetitive. I felt like once we'd been introduced to some of the elements in here, like I, I kind of had enough of them, but we kept revisiting them throughout the course of this. There were instances like fight scenes throughout here where I will say like I completely zoned out, did not care and just like came back after the fighting was over. As another negative of this, I didn't love the main character. He's very irritating and that is very, it's essentially his personality. It's not like an accidental irritation. He is an annoying person, but that did get to me a little bit. What I did like though, is there is like an element of found family in here and I liked that grouping, let's say. So yeah, if you like your fast paced sci-fi, if you like sci-fi horror, then this might be one for you. I say if you like sci-fi horror, I can't say how, how scary it is if you're somebody who reads a lot of sci-fi horror, but I enjoyed this one and I gave it four stars. This is the start of a series actually, which doesn't really, like I don't feel like it needs to be a series right until you get to the very last chapter, which leaves it in a place where like it's clearly like the plot is gonna develop. I don't know where we're going though. So um, yeah, I don't know. Will I continue? I don't feel 
feel like there needs to be a sequel is the thing but there's apparently more story to tell so yeah potentially I'll continue with this series because I did really enjoy this one. So those were the seven books that I read and the two that I DNF'd but there were two more books in February that I started and if we had 30 or 31 days in the month I definitely would have finished them as well but just so you know what my first books of March are going to be I am 170 pages into The Unbroken by C.L. Clarke which is an adult fantasy and I'm also 125 pages into Sanctuary by V.V. James which I'm listening to the audiobook of it's a full cast audio actually I'm really enjoying it and this one is it has a fantasy element in it it has an element of witchcraft but the tone of it is very much small tone thriller and it's reminded me a lot of Big Little Lies so if you are interested in my thoughts on either of these two books then please do stay tuned down in my comments let me know as usual what your favorite book of February was because I would love to know and also your opinions on any of the books that I read in February if you have also read any of them but aside from that please don't forget to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna if you head to my description box you'll find a link to my goodreads instagram and twitter if you'd like to follow me on any of those as well as a link to my bookish candle website the etsy for that and a 10 percent off discount code but that's it from me today guys bye oh you bite your friend like chocolate you say you're a go when nobody knows with guns sitting under our petticoats we're never gonna quit it no we're never gonna quit it no